Hello. Uh, so I'll talk today about uh, how to design AI applications for real time. And uh, we'll start with defining what real time means and uh, then talk about design and then I'll give an example of uh, beeswax. So what is real time? Uh, usually it's an application that uh, is, has a request response uh, architecture. So we do one prediction at a time or multiple predictions, but it's uh, relevant to this one request. And we have uh, li a limited uh, amount of time to respond and that's latency and then there is a throughput so how many of these requests you need to be able to, uh, to process per unit time. Uh, d the application basically de uh, defines the business requirements. So for example, for something like an, a loan officer application um, uh, up that helps the loan officer to determine uh, credit worthiness of, of uh, application for, for a loan, um, Maybe the application, it's okay for an application to respond within a few seconds, but some even a little longer is okay. For an online travel site, we had presentations from two today. Uh, a couple of seconds, under a second, overall response time, but at the same time, the, uh, the application has to make multiple predictions, sometimes thousands of predictions per request if you need to, let's say, um, evaluate thousands of uh, hotels for this one search. For ad an ad buying platform, which is beeswax, we need to be able to uh, provide a prediction within five to 10 milliseconds. And if we go into high frequency trading, uh, the time scale goes down to some microseconds sometimes. So how, does, uh, how do these constraints uh, influence design? So first of all, let's uh, look at the general picture. Of, uh, every machine learning system has a building stage and a scoring stage, and the uh, transformations of the input data have to be the same in both, and the building stage trains the model, then the model is serialized somehow, and the scoring um, typically is happening in a separate system uh, that does also the transformations and predictions, so everybody knows that. Uh, and the biggest uh, question to answer uh, is whether we want to pre-compute our predictions, store them, and look them up in real time, or we actually run the real time uh, predictions using machine learning model in, uh, in production in real time. And let's look at this system. So batch scoring left to right, we get new data. There is a scoring engine offline, does the transformations, does the predictions. The predictions are stored <coughs> somewhere on disk and then loaded into some sort of cache. Um, and uh, that cache is available in real time to a, a cons consumer that actually uses the prediction for some business logic. <coughs> some, uh, there, there may be, uh, a request with new data coming in, uh, the consumer has to uh, compute a key and look up the data that it needs. Uh, and there may be some default for cache misses. The real-time scoring uh, is simpler. The, consumer, the real-time consumer basically passes the request to the scoring engine and the, uh, the engine has to transform the data and produce the prediction uh, and return the, the answer. And there is uh, also a possibility for hybrid scoring, and uh, I think there was an example earlier in uh, one of the talks where the features are computed offline and then cached, and then uh, the prediction is happening in real time, but the features are computed offline. So what are the trade-offs uh, between batch and real time? So for batch, basically it's absolutely, uh, uh, it, it is possible to, to use any, pretty much any package, uh, any language, any algorithm on transformation. Whereas for real time, uh, it's limited to uh, certain, certain languages and packages and algorithms. Uh, by, and it's limited by both latency and throughput. So, <clears throat> if, um, uh, if the response time has to be fast and throughput is high, probably you, you, you end up being limited by uh, a system that runs some sort of 
C, C++ or, or, or Java or something similar, basically a compi compiled language. Uh, using complex features, so what is a complex feature? Uh, if we are predicting, let's say, a probability of a user buying a product, we may want to know the user's prior activity, so uh, in batch we can compute how many times we have been We've seen this user, but uh, in real time <clears throat> on a request, that information is not available un unless we cache those features and that becomes a hybrid. Uh, when we do predictions in batch, we sometimes uh, won't be able to predict every possible key. So uh, we'll have cache misses, so we, we cannot uh, have prediction for every request, whereas real time and hybrid <clears throat> will allow us to have some prediction at least. Then uh, there is the combinatorial uh, combination of features. So for example, if for advertising, if we, are, if we want to predict uh, some behavior on, for a given user, and we have hundreds of millions of users, and uh, websites, millions of websites, it becomes impractical to pre-compute every possible combination and store it. So you, again, you're forced to, to making uh, predictions in real time. The system complexity, uh, so I put medium in both batch and real time because it's still complex, but uh, you only need to build part of the hybrid system. Uh, so uh, in, in batch, you need to build the batch uh, scoring engine and, uh, and the real time cache, whereas in hybrid, uh, in the real time, you, you have to build the real time component, which is more difficult generally. And in hybrid, you need both. And the accuracy depends on application, but the idea here is that because um, in batch you can't have complex features, and in real time, um, no, uh, the other way around, in real time you can't have complex features, uh, and in batch uh, you cannot have combinatorics um, of, of um, dimensions, uh, hybrid will probably uh, provide the most accurate predictions. How uh, can we deploy the models is also important. So there are pretty much two ways. Uh, one is deploying data only, which, uh, for example, if, if it's a linear model, we can just ship coefficients to a scoring system, in which case the scoring code is completely independent, can be written entirely uh, by different people, and um, can be in a different language. For, uh, on the other hand, for batch, if it's uh, linear co coefficients, we can score in anything, even in SQL, because uh, it's just a matrix multiplication after all. So a more common scenario now is that uh, the model is persisted as code and data, some object that, that um, the training uh, framework saves and um, and uh, then uh, the same framework is loading this, this model object in, in, a scoring, uh, in a scoring engine, and it's primarily good for batch, uh, but sometimes, depending on the latency and throughput requirements, uh, it's possible to, say, have real-time Python backend, uh, and, and it's okay. So HTO takes uh, a different approach, and uh, it's producing code that is different from, from the, the modeling engine and produces Java uh, directly. And uh, we heard today that there is work on uh, having a C++ C Sharp uh, interface to, to the Poggio modules. And uh, the beauty of it is that you can use the same output in both um, batch in real time. And on top of that, module two, which is the output of a driverless, also includes feature transformations in the same, uh, in the same code. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about Beeswax. So we are a digital advertising buying platform. We, um, it's a startup, four years old, uh, founded by three ex-Googlers, and uh, we are based in New York. So, uh, the way digital advertising works is, well, again, left to right, if um, uh, a person uh, opens a page or, a, uh, or an app and there is an ad there, the ad 
the application sends the request for an ad because there's just ad space. It sends it to one or more exchanges, and the exchanges are not dissimilar to stock exchanges, really. Um, and those exchanges uh, then forward this request to uh, a number of buyers. And so Beeswax is one of the platforms that allows you to buy. So we, we're integrated with many, many exchanges, and we listen to almost uh, 2 million requests per second. And that's part of the service that we provide, that nobody needs to do it again. And uh, then the bid request goes to the bidder. There is a lot of business logic which I left out. But ultimately, uh, we need to make a decision of whether to bid on this opportunity and how much are we uh, willing to pay. And machine learning helps with making an intelligent decision. And uh, we enable advertisers to put their own data and put their own machine learning into our system. So uh, a typical machine learning, machine learning use case in advertising is campaign optimization. So for example, if I have a budget, uh, I want to spend the whole budget evenly over a given time period while maximizing the number of events of interest. Could be conversions, could be clicks, or something like that. And the Optimization algorithm basically needs to make that calculation, and uh, its optimization algorithm is not machine learning, but it's using the output of the machi of machine learning. So we want uh, to know the probability of the event, maybe the value of the event, to uh, like how much is the person going to spend on an uh, e-commerce site, for example, and some real-time metrics of how much <coughs> are we spending uh, now, uh, what budget is left and so on. And the output of that is a bid price. So for us, the real-time constraints are pretty stringent. Uh, we have, uh, so the inputs are billions of records on one hand, and um, uh, the latency that we want to achieve is about five milliseconds or less. Uh, each of our customers gets their own bidder, so, and the, the uh, throughput varies from, say, 10 to 100, uh, 1,000 QPS, uh, and our production st stack is Python for almost everything except for real time, which is C++ or Java. Uh, so we ended up choosing um, batch predictions with real time cache as a uh, kind of first iteration at least, and um, uh, so we use PySpark for training, for, for, feature, for data transformations, and we started using H2 driverless AI uh, as the training, eng a a training um, engine uh, and PySparkling with Mojo 2. So uh, driverless produ produces Mojo 2. We load it into Spark as a UDF, user-defined function, and uh, score in parallel in batch. Uh, we're pretty serious about infrastructure as code, so for me to start and stop uh, H2O server is literally running a command on my command line, and a few minutes later the uh, server is up or down. So the primary uh, considerations for, for us to use driverless uh, were, f first of all, that um, if feature engineering is solved sufficiently well, then uh, I don't know if anybody else has trouble finding good data scientists, but uh, in the past three jobs, I've, well, it's, it's been a challenge. So uh, data scientists really have other things to do if this is solved. And uh, an another huge thing is that finally, uh, both feature transformations and prediction engines are together and they're ready for real time. Uh, previously, I had to have a team of engineers basically implement custom feature transformations uh, for, uh, for real-time systems. So a little bit about driverless. It does provide an autopilot, but you still have to fly the plane. So uh, you need to experiment. Uh, ex setting experiments is easy, but uh, it, it does require work, and uh, you do get results out. Uh, we needed a reasonably large machine, uh, and another constraint for us was that because we wanted to use Mojo 2, uh, it was limited to XGBoost and GLM. So um, in any machine learning system, 
there is a trade-off between accuracy and complexity of the model. Uh, for uh, us, it turned out that complexity of the model increases dramatically while accuracy levels off. And um, because we're in the cloud, complexity uh, entirely leads to cost. So uh, we, we get larger modules, so it needs more memory, more CPU. And uh, so there is a trade-off that is fa was fairly easy to find. Uh, and here is um, there's a, a, a blue and red uh, examples are, it's the same data set, but in one case, I only took 10 columns, and <clears throat> in other case, it's about 50. Uh, so the plot shows the accuracy versus the configuration of accuracy in driverless. So as we go from 1 to 10 in, uh, in accuracy in driverless, you see that uh, in both cases, the accuracy of the output model kind of levels off. But um, and so there is, there is a, uh, a place where it makes sense. And then uh, another thing is that this is a clear uh, demonstration that more data is often better than a better, a better, more complex algorithm. So to uh, summarize, uh, when designing for real time, define what that means first. Uh, make a choice between batch predictions and real time predictions or a hybrid. Um, driverless does solve the feature engineering problem saves tons of time. And uh, module two is super exciting for me because uh, of feature transformation code that's uh, just ready for real time. Thank you. I can answer questions. Uh, no, we're not hiring in London at the moment, uh, not technical. We, will, we are hiring uh, in London for sales and uh, customer support. If there are any questions, uh, you can post it on Slido for Sergey. Okay, we have questions here. ONNX, I'm not familiar with. Uh, help. Oh, um, so that would. So it's it's. Is it like PMML? That same idea. So it's it's also a possibility. So basically, you need your score your scoring engine to to speak the same. Language as uh, uh, as your 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 training. So uh, the, I try uh, repeat the question. So the the, the uh, open model format is supported by uh, many vendors. Uh, so when I looked at it uh, in the past, basically it was part of the discovery. Uh, actually, not just this time, but the previous few times. Um, it there were, I can't remember the exact. Uh, things that did not work because we, we have other considerations uh, uh, except for scale, and we basically we decided not to use it. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the break. Thank you.